All right, let's talk about Newton's universal law of gravitation. Um, so you might remember from our discussions of Rene Descartes and Galileo Galilei uh, that the idea of the Earth going around the sun, so let's draw the sun, right? Here's the sun, and then here's the Earth. The idea of the Earth going around the sun um, needed two, two kind of shifts in the perspective of most people. The first was that the Earth was capable of moving. Now, Galileo and Descartes demonstrated that all objects uh, are in motion, and so explaining their movements is not important. And of course, Isaac Newton kind of gave us a word for this capability of objects to maintain their motions when he described their laziness or their inertness or their inertia. Um, so that would explain why the Earth is moving, because there's nothing pushing it. Forces don't cause motion, they change motion. So the Earth, according to Descartes and Galileo, should just be moving in a straight line throughout the universe for forever. Um, but ironically, it is still changing its motion. And the way that it changes its motion is with a circle. Um, or it's more of an ellipse, but we'll say that it's a circle for this part. So what Isaac Newton did was suggest that there was an action between the sun and the earth that was always causing the earth's velocity to change direction. Not to increase or decrease in speed, but to always be changing its direction. So the force that he called this was gravity. And he identified this force as... Uh, a centripetal force. So the sun and the earth both experience this inward pull that is a centripetal force. Now they're uh, a third law pair, meaning for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. They both experience the same force. And for the sun, this force barely uh, causes it to wobble. But for the earth, this force is so large that it actually acts as a centripetal force, constantly changing the direction of the velocity of the Earth and, and causing the circular orbit that we normally see. Now, Isaac Newton was so precise that he was able to say this force of gravity between um, planets, orbiting planets and their center objects, is proportional to the product of their masses. So for this would be the mass of the Sun and the mass of the Earth, divided by the distance between their centers, which we'll call R, squared. We should make a note to say this is R. Okay, so this is a really, really important relationship, and we use this to understand the universal law of gravitation. Um, a few years later, really not that much longer, there was a guy named Henry Cavendish, and what Henry Cavendish did was establish this experimentally in this thing called the Cavendish Experiment. So here's Henry Cavendish. He was a very weird man. He had um, the most money at in the Bank of England at the time of his death. Like, he had the largest possible account in the Bank of England. Um, he was super wealthy. He was considered to be autistic by a lot of people, a lot of researchers, because he was only capable of talking to one person at a time, meaning he could not address one to two, like he couldn't be in a room of three people and talk to all of them. He could only talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and he was also so afraid of women that he only could communicate to his own female house servants by note, like he would have to hand them written notes. And he was even so weird that he had a staircase built onto the back of his house so that he wouldn't have to interact with any of the female workers in his uh, establishment. And he was so crazy that he never got a portrait done of himself. And this picture that you're looking right now of Henry Cavendish is actually drawn from a friend of his who, after Cavendish had died, he left his coat on the rack of his lab. And his friend looked at that coat and then filled in from memory what Henry Cavendish looked like. So this isn't even a real face. That's a ghost face. This is the original ghost face killer. Now, in his backyard, he had this crazy thing called the Cavendish experiment. The Cavendish experiment was an entirely wooden enclosed experiment. So like in the back of his property was this big wooden box and he would walk up to it. And then if you look at these little lanterns on the side right here, he didn't want light to get into his experiment, so you had to open up this little latch and then allow light, a little bit of light to go through this hole, and then you would look at a telescope that then showed the measurements in this torsional wire. And he created what's called a torsional balance. Now, the torsional balance essentially is going to measure the force of attraction of two balls that are on a stick as they are attracted to these other massive objects. Now he actually performed this experiment and found uh, that the force of gravity varied with the mass of two objects, we'll call them M1, M2, 
over the distance between them squared with a constant that we now call the universal gravitational constant, or g. So g now is accepted as 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th, and we'll use the units of newtons times uh, kilogram, I'm sorry, meters squared over kilogram squared. You can use a lot of different units. So this is the accepted value. And Henry Cavendish in the 1700s, in one year of research, was able to get within 1% of this value with his insane experiment that was in the backyard of his man, you know, mansion, his establishment. So a guy that nobody knew what he looked like that had the most money in England would walk down a secret staircase on the back of his house because he was afraid of girls to go out to his shed to look through a telescope into a dark, dark torsional balance where he would measure the rotation in a little tiny wire. That's how crazy this guy is. Anyway, we call this the universal law of gravity, and this is the equation that we use to figure out, um, say, the attraction of the sun and the earth to each other. So let's take a look at that. The earth has a mass of 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. The sun has a mass of 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. On average, the distance between their centers is 1.49 times 10 to the 11th. Let's find the force that the sun experiences um, with gravity. So let's redraw our picture. Here we have the sun, yay, and here's the earth. Fantastic. Uh, and we know that the force of gravity is a shared interaction between the two. And the distance between their centers, R, is 1.49 times 10 to the 11th meters. Now this equation is really easy. If I want to figure out what the force of gravity experienced by either is, then all I need to do is take G and multiply it by the product of both masses divided by the distance between their centers. So this becomes 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times meters squared per kilogram squared, so that's, you know, g. Then we do the product of their masses, which is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms times, ugh, I'm already sick of this, 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, and then you divide that by the distance between their centers, 1.49 times 10 to the 11th meters, and you square that value. Okay, now when you put this entire monster of numbers into your calculator, you're going to get 3.56 or 3.57 times 10 to the 22nd newtons, which is a very large force. Okay, now sometimes I like to call this equation gimme r squared because it looks like g m, you know, gimme over r squared. Let's, uh, let's now talk about the next thing. Now, since for the most part, when you're dealing with the force of gravity that is experienced by something near the surface of the Earth, you may have noticed that our equation for the force of little g is m times little g. This number, 9.8 or 10 meters per second squared, if you're doing the test, um, that we call the acceleration due to gravity. Well, now that you know what the force of gravity actually is from a universal standpoint, g m1 m2 over r squared, hopefully you've kind of realized that g is really these three constants, where m1 is the thing that's being orbited. In this case, you could think of it as the mass of the Earth, and this is the mass of an object, m and me. And we could call that me and just call that m. Okay, so it looks like that, um, and it's basically like saying little g times m, where little g is the gravitational constant times the mass of, we'll say, the Earth, but it could be like the moon or anything like that, the thing being orbited. And this is our new equation for how you can figure out what the acceleration near the surface of the Earth or at a certain height would be because of an object's gravity or its weight. Now, we can use this to find things like what's the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth, or um, maybe you want to figure out what the free fall acceleration would be for a airplane, as it is, you know, a certain height above the Earth's surface. Then you could use that equation to try and, and figure out that value. Um, sometimes this is also known as the field strength, the gravitational field strength. So if you're asked for that, it's asking you to find little g with this new equation. Let's see how it works out. 
Okay, an airplane is at an altitude of 2,000 meters above the surface of the Earth. See, told you that was going to happen. And you know that the radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the 6th, and its mass is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th. So to find the acceleration due to gravity, we're going to need the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, or again, if it was the moon, we would use the mass of the moon, and then r squared, where that's going to be the distance between the plane and then the center of the Earth. So that's going to involve two numbers. First, it's going to involve the 20,000 meters above the surface, but it's also going to involve the radius of the Earth, which I'll call re. So when you put this in your calculator, you're going to use 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times uh, meters squared over kilograms squared. Now the mass of the Earth, you're going to do 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. But for the radius, you are going to have to do that um, 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters plus to 20,000 meters, and then square that value. So if you put this correctly in your calculator, the number that you should get is 9.75. meters per second squared. Fantastic. Ba barely less than 9.8. Okay, let's see how we can use this to find the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the moon. So in this problem, you have the mass of the moon, the radius, and you want to find the acceleration due to gravity. So it's easy. We just do g, in this case we'll say mass of the moon, divided by r, which in this case, since it's near the surface of the moon, we can just use the whole radius. So 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons times meters squared over kilogram squared times the mass of the moon, 7.4 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms over the radius of 1.75 times 10 to the third, oh, sorry, 10 to the third kilometers. So really we need to make that 10 to the sixth meters, that is important, and then we square that distance. So you put all this in your calculator, and you should get 1.6 meters per second squared. So there you go. You'll either be asked to find the force of, due to, of, of gravity, sorry, the force of gravity, because gravity is a force, or if you're asked to find the acceleration due to gravity, then you use um, this little equation right here to find g.